Today, I'm going to be holding down this event with uh, my colleague. Uh, her name is Victoria. Uh, of course, is going to really, really be wonderful. I understand that lots of people have joined from different uh, places, uh, not just here in the UK. So if you wouldn't mind, you can type on the chat box. Uh, you can make use of the chat box and, and just tell us your name and where you're joining us from uh, so that we know how many people that are here with us today. Just your name and where you're joining us from. So we have Olumide, who is joining from Nigeria. Uh, Yes, uh, of course, I'm joining from Bolton University here. Uh, we have Luis from Bolton. Uh, we have Fazia Mohamed from Bolton. Uh, Jeremiah also from Bolton, UK. Uh, lots of people, of course, joining us from Bolton. So keep the chat, uh, keep the things coming on the chat and uh, we will definitely be taking note of the people that have joined us from different places. We have someone joining us from London. Wow. All right. So uh, without wasting time, just because we have just about what, one hour to have this event going, we have a wonderful resource person who is going to be talking to us about something that will really, really benefit each and every one of us, especially those of us who are master students and of course those of us who are aspiring to be master students uh, uh she's going to be talking about something that will really really benefit us and I, I i would like each and every one of us to make sure you have a pen and a paper so that you can uh, write down some things uh your your smartphones also will do the great job if you don't want to use a uh a note or uh, 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 any other thing you you might don't want to you know use your bio to write you might just want to type so your phones will be handy without further ado i'm going to also be uh recognizing some really really great people here uh one of them is the head of school of arts and acting she's right here with us and she's also the head of creative technology in university of bolton She's no other person but uh, Sam Johnson. I'm going to be letting her unmute her mic and so she can talk to us and welcome us to this event formally. Uh, Sam Johnson, you're welcome. Thank you, Thank you Kel. Um, that's a fantastic introduction. What a great, what a great start of that is. Um, yes, welcome everybody. I'm Sam Johnson, head of the School of Arts and Creative Technologies. And it's a real privilege for me to be here this evening um, in this inaugural series, the inaugural event of an inaugural series of, of November to Remember talks. So there's a fantastic range of, of sessions, seminars and discussions ahead of us over the next few weeks. Um, and Jane, who's going to be kicking off today, that sounds like a fantastic talk as well. So I'll be staying with you throughout throughout the, the whole evening. Um, obviously, this is an exciting time for the computing department, not just because we have this great range of talks, um, but you know, we've got lots of new courses. There's the, the atmosphere is buzzing, the corridor where students are studying, there's a great dynamic and it's so exciting to be part of this developing, growing area in the university. And I think what's so important as well about this series is that we're extending our national and international reach, um, both in terms of the students and participants that can join us, but also the speakers. What we want to do is to really embrace collaborative working, collaborative partnership, whether that's in teaching, knowledge exchange, or in research. And this is one of those steps forward. I think a, a series of talks like this is the way in which to develop these partnerships, hear voices from other organizations from across the whole world, which can enrich our learning environment. So it is, it's a real pleasure to be part of this. I have to say a huge thank you to Celestine uh, for setting up this series. Um, it's a really exciting development for us. And that's enough from me. So back to you, Kel, if I may. All right, thank you, Sam. Thank you for that wonderful message. And uh, we really appreciate that. I can see lots of faces still joining us. Some people joining us from uh, Manchester, Wolverhampton, and uh, uh, people also join, still joining us from Bolton here. I want to tell you all that today is going to really, really be wonderful. And uh, thank you all for switching on your camera. It's going to be a wonderful evening, just like Sam has told us. Um, just to share something, just to let you know that uh, this is what we'll be running with, just like a, a skeleton of what the program is going to look like. Uh, 
right now we are actually had uh, our opening speech by Sam Johnson. And uh, I'm going to be inviting um, Victoria very soon to talk about the resource person that we have today by name Jane Egerton Idehen. Sorry, Jane, if I have uh, pronounced your name in a way that I that probably will, <laughs> will end me some sort of uh, uh, spanking. I'm really sorry if I pronounced that wrongly, but I'm going to be having Victoria very soon uh, talk about Jane, who is going to be talking to us today. Uh, after which we are going to have a question and answer session. So if you have a question, just make sure that you get ready with that question because you will have uh, a time where you will have to unmute your mic or if you don't want to talk about it, you can make use of the chat box. And uh, after that, we are going to have a presentation by the uh, head of school, of course, Sam Johnson again, before we have the closing remarks. So right now I'm going to be inviting um, Victoria, to talk about the wonderful resource personality that we have today who is going to be talking to us. Victoria? Hi, Kelly. Okay, hi everyone. Um, are you seeing my desktop? Yes, yes, we can see okay. it. You're welcome once more um, to this um, section. We have no other person here than Jane Hector Udine. She's the head of Facebook for Middle mm -hmm. East and Africa. She completed her first degree at the University of Nigeria where she studied electrical and electronics engineering. She later went to Warwick Business School in UK, Harvard Business School and Yale School of Management in the United States. Before working at Facebook, she was the country manager in Nigeria and the regional sex director for West Africa for Authentic Communication Group PLC she also worked at Nokia and Ericsson. Jane is an actor of the bestseller, Be Felix, Give Yourself Permission to Be You. She is passionate about encouraging and promoting girls at STEAM. She wants people to have a successful career. She does this through her books, talks, articles, videos, and her NGO, Women and Career. She has spoken at Tanks Program, the African Science Academy, Asha University in Ghana, CIFA Set Up Hangout, to mention a few. Equid Set Show Extrovert and Physical Fitness Proponent, Jane Enjoy Golf, Cycling, and Sarcella. She also went, she also writes a regular telecom column for business and financial terms, Ghana. She and her husband, Hector Eden, have a son, Asia, and a daughter, Sarah, who inspires Jane to continue to push for diversity in male-dominated fields. You are welcome, Jane. Thanks a lot, Victoria. <laughs> That was, a, that was a very, I had to sit down and listen to all that, Victoria. <laughs> at some point, I'm like, I hope she's going to end. Is that me she's talking about? But oh, thank yes. you so much. I really appreciate it. And I, I'm grateful as well, Celestine, for the opportunity to share. Um, before I start, do you have my slides yet? Or should I share them? Yes. Um, try if you can. If not, I can. Okay, if you could share them, it will help me with the multitasking. Okay, okay. <laughs> okay, good. But I'll do a quick intro while he, he, we try to sort out the tech. So like she said, my name is Jane Egerton Ideha. And yes, um, I know he, um, uh, Kalechi was talking about, you know, murdering the name. Don't worry, everybody goes through that. It's Idehe, <laughs> not uh, Idehe. I've, I've had a couple of that. Um, okay. I, I'm actually Nigerian, but I'm currently based in Dublin because I manage a sales team 
the sales, I had the sales team in charge of Middle East and Africa for Facebook. And this is almost my 20 year career journey in the sales route, though I started as an engineer. So that's an interesting one. So disclaimer, I have a daughter that is 10 and she has checked all the slides and she confirms to me that the slides are perfect. <laughs> she's, my, she's my assistant. But no, no, let's start this interesting topic. When um, Celestine reached out, I thought, oh, this was a good one to, to share because I'm really passionate about employability, career, growing your career, especially as a woman in tech. And I'll start by really telling a story. I'm a storyteller, by the way, so I love telling stories. So um, like 20 years ago, because this is exactly 2001, um, I just graduated from engineering in University of Nigeria, and I was looking for a job. So normally what we would do is like you print out the CVs, you go to like a cyber cafe or like one of these business units and print out lots of hard copies of your CVs. Then you go around, um, you go to like companies um, and you ask, you ask for like the HR, head of HR or the operations manager or the admin supervisor. So depending on the con uh, company, they have different people in charge of recruitment. Then you hand out the CVs. And the whole intention is that someone reads the CV and someone finds you. Now they read the CV, they are happy and they tell you will come for an interview or come for a test. And if we dial back to last year, so last year I got this job with Facebook. I actually started with Facebook in February. And I'll tell you how I got the job in contrast to how I got my first job. So what I just told you was how I got my first job, going around uh, Lagos, handing over those CVs, writing tests, going for interviews, sometimes outside Lagos. Last year, I started becoming very um, visible on LinkedIn a couple of years ago. I written a book. I share my thoughts on LinkedIn in terms of my sector, what's going on, and my career journey. And someone reached out to me on LinkedIn, sent me a message and said he was a headhunter and he wanted to talk to me about an opening. Funny enough, I told him I wasn't so keen about an opening. I wasn't, he's like, no, no, just, let's just chat about the job. I will see how it goes, you know? So we talked about the job, but what I found was interesting that he knew more about me than I could, you know, our lack. I said, he was telling me about articles I'd written and comments I'd made. And he actually, I could tell that he understood what my core values were, where I was headed in my career, and even my career journey and some of my skill sets, because he was speaking to some of the, he was speaking to some of the, you know, the, the materials I'd put out there. And I thought it was interesting. So we started on this journey, we spoke, and within like a month, I'd done interviews. All this was happening from my dining room in Lagos, by the way. I didn't go anywhere. It was, you know, COVID, there was a lockdown and people were not traveling. So this was all happening in my dining room. We did all the interviews all the way to the head of the, um, you know, the different heads of Facebook. I was offered the job. And the only thing was that I had to travel because the leadership team sits in Dublin. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. So I told that story because I wanted to set the tone for how the day will run, because I wanted to, you to see where I was coming from and what was happening now in terms of getting a job. I will speak to that. So one of the things we'll talk about is the global trends when it comes to employability. Talk about top skills that are really being ranked by companies. And really, what, it, what, what does that word mean? And what does it mean to be employable? Then I'll share some of my thoughts on career nuggets, which is some of my experience going my career, what I think have made successful careers along the way. So I told you that story because if you go to the next slide, exactly, because these are the things that have influenced the way I was recruited between 2001 when I got my first job and 2020 when I got to Facebook. What has, what has mattered globally has changed the way we do business has changed. The way we recruit has changed because of some of those global trends. And some of the things I know I didn't put out there are things like the fact that, you know, there's a change in the power structure. Now you have more we call a global economy or what we call, um, it's like a global economy. So literally your skill set is being, is up for the global market. You know, you could be in your room in Lagos, 
or your room in Bangladesh and you're vying for a job in Silicon Valley. And you could actually work from Lagos or somewhere in Pakistan, but you're working for a company in California and being paid by that company in California. So these global trends are changing the way companies operate, what is important to companies and the skill sets they are looking for. So on the right, I know you can see that there's a whole um, infographic there, but it's showing like the big blue one, there's a big trend for healthcare, the orange one for tech related jobs. Why you see at the bottom of the graph, you see the purple circles is showing that um, manual labor, things to do with uh, you know, manufacturing, hands-on skills, we are losing a bit of traction. So those jobs are declining. While the top ones to do with knowledge-based skills, things that are calling for your soft skills or your critical creative parts are becoming the fast growing skill sets or trends. Okay, let's go to the next slide. Yes, thank you very much. So in terms of how we group them, the World Economic Forum. So if you look at the, the right, I put all those skill sets there, but you can literally look at four growth skills. So it's a combination of four core skills. And some of the four skills we are seeing that plays an important role are things like problem solving, self-management, working with others, use of technology. If you think carefully, I have not mentioned any hard skills. So hard skills are most times some of the skills you have to acquire for a specific job. Um, so you have to uh, have skills like for a sector, you have to know a particular skill set for that sector. So, for example, maybe like a software engineer has to know how to program, you know, coding becomes a hard skill. So these are core skills they have to have. But what we found out that in the workforce, what is really pushing growth is the growth skills or the soft skills. And some of those skills are difficult to teach. They are acquired but they can still be taught. They can be taught using some you know, experience, putting yourself in the right situation. So I just wanted to speak to this because um, that trend continues to happen. And we are seeing by 2025 with all the automation and all the other things I've spoken about, the skill sets will tend to be more soft skill focused than more hard skills focus. And we find out that sectors, could you, could you move to the next uh, slide? Thank you so much, yes. So these are some of the, in terms of top jobs, and you can see a lot of them have been influenced by tech. So what we are seeing is a convergence of industries or sectors. So you will hear things like agri-tech, health tech. Everything has a bit of a tech influence to it. So we call it the fourth industrial revolution, but it just means that the lines are blurring. The skill set you're requiring for some sectors are transferable to other sectors. So someone that has a, a digital skill set can literally work in media, but can also work in the pharmaceutical sector, can also work in the power sector. So the lines are being blurred, which is a positive thing. It's a good thing for everyone on this call. It means that with the right skill sets, there's no, the sky is your limit. It means that no industry would hold you back. You know how we used to go to school, you study medicine, you gotta be a doctor. You study engineering, you have to be an engineer. Now I'm saying you study engineering and you could decide you wanna use that skill set somewhere else because the skill sets are so transferable now. If we go to the next slide. So that's just in terms of the trend. And I wanted to set that scene. So you, you, you see where we're going in terms of there is a shift in the market. And that means you also have to bear that in mind. As you're going into the workforce, it has to be key to you that, am I acquiring the skill set, or do I have the skill set, or am I positioning myself for that skill set that will make me stick out? That's really what you want. In simple terms, you want to stand out. You want to have interviewers interview 20 people and you stand out. You want to have headhunters look at 50 people and you stand out. So that is what you're looking for. What are those skill sets that will make me stand out in the workplace? So let's talk about the skill sets. And that's really what we're going to talk about this evening. Oh, by the way, you, you would have a question. So I will do like, a, I don't know, talking for like another, a total of 30, 40 minutes, but I really want to hear your questions and I will address them. So being in Facebook or being in management for, over 10 years, what I'm speaking to is what we look for. 
and it's evolved over time. So in the initial days, when I'm recruiting, I have been given a pile of CVs. And the first thing I go to is, you know, what did they study? What was their grade? We use all that as a baseline. Then we say, okay, this person has studied engineering. They made a, I don't know, first class or two one. But these are changing these days. These days when I'm given an interview, uh, an applicant CV, I'm looking at their skill set. I did a couple of interviews. I've been doing a couple of interviews for the past two weeks. I don't think I can remember any of their schools, whatever school they attended, because it wasn't the criteria. They just had to have a basic, we just wanted to be sure they have a basic university degree. But if you ask me about the school, it wasn't a criteria. Their religion, their sex, their gender, even where they lived wasn't a criteria. What was really important to us was the skill set. So let's talk about the skill set. If you move to the next slide. So that initial slide I presented with all this fancy, you know, almost 15, 20 skill sets, you know, the World Economic Forum says people need. This is like a summary of all those skill sets. So the combination of these skill sets will give you any other skill sets. So this is like the core or the growth skill sets. Critical thinking, which is just that ability to think critically, you know, to ask questions, to question the status quo, to analyze things, creativity, which is quite key. You know, we all talk about creativity and what does really creativity speak to? It just asking, you know, speaking from the point of view of asking how could we do it better or getting into that problem solving mode or being just curious. Because that's what creative people do, isn't it? They're just curious. They're not taking things the way they're given. Time management or attention management, if you want to call it that, you know, some people say, you know, we can't manage time because can't, time is finite. But attention management, so how do I structure my time? How do I prioritize my time that I can give things that are more important, more valuable time than the others? Self-management, becoming very important. Literally, how are you managing yourself? Do you know who you are? Do you know what you want? Because if you know who you are, what you want, you're a bit more confident. You'll be more, you'll be goal-driven. Social intelligence is another one. And that is, you know, it speaks to the name. It's just like emotional intelligence. And that really speaks to, you know, when Sam said, you know, one of the key things she liked about today's presentation when she was introducing it, or the, the, the whole program is the fact that um, the school is learning to collaborate. In my mind, I thought, wow, did Sam see my slides? But really, that's what we are looking for in the workplace is social intelligence and just the ability to work with other people. Can you connect? Can you listen? Can you collaborate? That's what social intelligent people do. If you can do all this, you will learn how to persuade. You will learn how to negotiate. You know a bit of conflict management because you know how to work with others. And these skill sets are be they're even becoming more important. You know, now you have to even do them virtually. Now, initially we were doing them, you know, physically. So connection is easy, isn't it? When you can meet someone in the office, have coffee. Now you have to do it over a screen set, um, a screen or a video conference when you're all at the same time trying to read their body language. Is it a yes or is it a no? So a combination of this skill set is what creates collaboration, leadership. Every other secondary skill set that are also part of the soft skill set is just a combination of these. Now, the good news is that you can acquire them. There's a school of thought about, you know, is it nature, is it not? But I know that these skill sets can be acquired with training, with having the right experience. But another good thing about these skill sets is the fact that once you have these skill sets, you can always evolve with them, you can get better. And these are the skill sets that will make you stand out in the office or in, the, or in your career. And these are the skill sets that will make you grow. So because they're not tied to any sector or in any industry, you're very fluid. You can change sectors, you can change industries. What is important is that you can speak to these skill sets. And that brings me to the next slide. Please go to the next slide, thank you. So now let's talk about some of the things I think is required, some of the things we are looking for. Remember my story when I started about, you know, walking around the streets of Lagos with a hard copy CV to just being in my house and posting things on LinkedIn and people listening and seeing them. Positioning starts becoming key. 
So the dynamics have changed from the global trend, isn't it? Positioning now, recruiters are now looking for you in a different space. Before we go to recruiters, we have to go and hand in our CVs. Now, recruiters look for you. And when people look for you, what do you do? You have to learn to position yourself. That is very important. And I will speak to some of the things you can do. If you go to the next slide. This, I know a lot of people, like when I share articles about it, I see a couple of people be like, oh my God, I'm so uncomfortable with this, you know, uh, I'm invisible, like, is it bragging? Is it, you know, am I gonna be like trying to be too forward? It is so important, you know why? In about two weeks time, myself and my leadership team will be doing some form of recruitment. And I'll tell you what we are gonna do. We're gonna block a couple of hours on a Friday and we will go on LinkedIn and start checking people's profile. That is how we're trying to recruit. We're looking for people's profile. We're going to chat groups to see comments people are making, to give us a bit of insight, like, oh, well, this is the comment this person made. This is how they're thinking. Oh, this might be a good candidate. Let's put him in there. So it is so important that you be visible. The tools are already there. Just use them. And, you know, first of all, you have to get the whole notion of, you know, like, oh, I'm being too forward or you're bragging. No, if it's something, you know, it's, it's all about how you see it. And it's just like your CV. In your CV, you speak to the skill sets you have, the experiences you have. Now you have the ability to do it in a dynamic way. CVs are static. Now you can do it on the fly. So the, the more you improve yourself, you can tell us about it. You don't have to wait until the end of the year when you update your CV. You went for a training, you could share your thoughts about the training. Somebody post something about a topic you like or a topic you're interested in. You can ask him questions. You can talk about it. So being visible is so relevant because that's the only way we're going to find you now. CVs are a bit of cake. I'm not saying people are going to recruit using CVs, but I'm saying for the big brands I've worked for, for the multinationals, we're going to these platforms and we are looking for people. So why don't you use the platforms to your benefit? Just learn to be comfortable in sharing either your work, your thoughts, or asking questions. Or just share a bit about yourself, at least the parts you're, you're comfortable. And when I mean share about yourself, I'm not talking about, you know, talking about your private life and you know, or your personal life. I'm talking about your professional life or in terms of your career ambitions, your take on your career. Those give us insight. And that's us having a bit of experience about who you are. Something else I want to talk about, about also is learning to engage. And that is so important because you know, when I say be visible, I'm not saying just go and put up a LinkedIn profile. So that's one. Or put up one of these social media profiles. How do you know who you really are if you don't engage? And the way I see this is like I was explaining to someone the other day. It's like showing up for a dinner party. You see like those three ladies gathered there. And you show up for the dinner party everybody's talking about the dinner or food or something and the entire dinner you were quiet and at the end of the dinner you left first of all i don't think anybody's going to remember you secondly nobody even knows anything about you because you didn't share anything we don't know what you're thinking what your thoughts are what your ideas are what you like what you don't like so if you're on these platforms i'll say engage and engagement is in different forms it doesn't have to be tied to your personality. I think you should even write on your personality. Use what works for you. If you're introverted, use what works for you. If you're extroverted, use what works for you. So engagement could be things like if you want to be sharing content, yeah, you could share content, like really create your own content, your write, post, but you could decide I'm not the sharing content type. You could repurpose other people's content. Somebody writes something you like or publish something you like, you repurpose and like, oh, interesting article I read. These are two things I learned from it. Oh, I love something about this article. Have you guys read this article? I'm curious to know this in the article. Or even ask the author of the article. So engagement could be in that form. It could be liking the article and commenting on the article. It could be repurposing the article. It could be creating your own article. It could just even be asking questions. You know, all those things are okay. We are trying to really understand who you are. So we can make a better decision if you're a good fit. So if you could go to the next slide. Yes, thank you. So apart from engagement, I want to talk about something as well that I also 
having been doing a couple of interviews this past week, because I told myself I didn't want to speak to things you can have information out there. So I felt things like, you know, how to do your CV and how to do interviews. They're just all over the, you know, knowledge is so abundant now. You can Google it and find it. But I wanted to speak to this because I felt sometimes we see mistakes show up. I think before you should show up uh, for an interview or a discussion with your recruiter headhunter, also do your research. Because when you do your research, you tend to have a full, full engagement. You know, when we are chatting, like I told you about the recruiter, what caught my attention was that he read my articles. So we we're also talking about the articles. Oh, you said something about this. What's your take on this? And why did you say this? So I think it's so important. And in every form. So it could be you want to have a coffee chat with someone you met, met on LinkedIn because you're interested in the organization. I think you should do a bit of research before you go for the coffee chat. Find a little bit about their company or the person or what they do. Something that when you're engaging is more fulfilling. Also, learn to reach out for informal chats. You know, that's part of showing up. You know, don't just be on those platforms. You know, if you see an organization or someone doing something you like, I would ping them, you know. I made a habit to have what I call virtual coffee chats. And I try to do one a week. I try when I can. And normally I do with someone I really don't know. I see an interesting profile on LinkedIn. I see somebody saying something thoughtful. I would like ping them. Oh, I like what you said. I'd like to hear more about this. Are you open for a virtual coffee? And I think those are good ways for you also in the in the workforce or you know, looking for employment to create that connection and also to show up. Let me tell you a story. When I was in, so I used to head a team in Ghana. I was managing Ericsson's operations. And in hindsight, if I recall, most of the people I employed, very few, I employed, employed through the formal process. Most of them were through informal process. I had a chat with someone interesting and I told them, hey, I think you, you sound interesting. I need to talk, talk chat with someone. And before you know it, I'm getting you to chat with my HR. Uh, someone comes and intends with me or works with me and I, I really, you know, we see the way they work and I'm like, you know what, let's put the tab on this person. If they really want to work for this company, these are the kind of people, let's ask if they want to stay. We would like to recruit them. So those informal chats are important. And something else I wanted to speak about, because people ask me this a lot, there's been a change in the way we interview people. And I thought I should just speak about this because I didn't want to talk about interviews. Uh, most multinationals, at least the ones I work for, when we interview you, we ask you behavioral type questions. And it's good to Google that. So you'll notice we're no longer going to be asking where do you live, where do you stay, um, um, you know, where did you go to school, some of those basic things we ask. Now we're asking to understand your skill sets and how you apply them. So you see all those skill sets I mentioned, we will be asking you questions regarding where have you used those skill sets? And it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be on a job. It could be you were coaching a soccer, uh, a soccer team. It could be managing your siblings at home. So when we are asking you about collaboration, we'll be asking you questions like, can you tell me a situation where you had to, you know, influence a team to work with you on something that there was a huge tension or conflict about. You could tell me it was your siblings, it's fine. If you could tell me that, you know, if you could, in explaining that situation you manage, I, sorry, I could see the skill set show up. So what we are really looking for when we ask you that is, first of all, you tell me the problem you solved. So you give me the problem statement. Oh, where I had to work with, you know, I had a situation where I had to collaborate with this, or I had a situation where I had a tough timeline. So you tell me the problem statement and you tell me what you actually did. So what are the five, three, four things you did to address it? How did you solve it? Then finally, you tell me the outcome. That's all we, all we want, what was the outcome? And it's always good to quantify it. So at the end of the day, I was able to get my siblings to agree to watching TV at 7 p.m. instead of 8 p.m. At the end of the day, I was able to increase the company's ROI or reduce the company's cost. At the end of the day, I was able to get over 100 people to attend the webinar. And you know, just quantify the outcome. I just thought I mentioned it there because I see a lot of people coming to interviews and they are all over the place. This is one good way to answer those questions. Yes. So let's. 
oh gosh, I'm always using up the time. Let's quickly go to some. So those are things I just thought you should know, you know, entering into the workforce, looking for a job, trying to be employed, um, trying to be employable or positioning yourself. Now let's talk about some things that could also help you when you're actually in the workforce. And I wanted to share this because from my own personal experience, I think these are things that can mean you even in the workforce be successful. So now in actually growing your career, one, please just move to the next slide. Thank you. A good way to approach it is that your career is a journey. And I say this again and again and again. It's not a linear progression. Sometimes it feels like you went forward. Sometimes it feels like you went sideways. Sometimes it even looks like you went one step backwards. But what's important is that are you acquiring the skill sets for your ultimate vision? So think about it. You started off in engineering and all of a sudden you find yourself in sales. So it's not always like a straight progression and be comfortable with that. Because if you are, you'll be opening to taking up that experience and acquiring the skill sets you need. That is what you need for where you're going. So if you plot it as a linear progression, you get overwhelmed because you're thinking, okay, this year I'm this, next year I have to be this, the other year I have to be this. If you're not open to a journey, you will not take up that experience well. So please see it as a journey. It's not a linear progression where every day is a step forward and a step forward. <laughs> oh, I think we all have to meet. I could hear. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, I think, could we meet everyone? Thank you very much. Because we could hear someone in the background. So the second thing you, you also have to be aware is that your learning doesn't end. I see people say, oh, I just want to finish this master's. I just want to finish this undergraduate study. And that is it. If you really want to evolve and grow in your career, it is a continuous learning process. And when I mean learning, you're unlearning, you're relearning. So sometimes you're unlearning something you learn. Sometimes you're relearning something new. Or, or, or learning something you've already learned before, but in a different form. So you have to be open to really learning. And learning sometimes has to be you, mean you investing in yourself. It takes me to the next slide here. Yeah. Probably have to hurry this one up. Next slide, please. Thank you. Next slide. Thank you. And what is important is the quotes. I love this quote by Stephen Covey that what grows is what gets watered. The good thing is that those growth skill sets or soft skill sets are skill sets if you continue to involve, to invest in them, they will grow. And there are different ways you can invest. Sometimes it's just you volunteering, taking up an opportunity that pushes you to grow a certain amount of skill set. Sometimes it could mean you actually going for a training and learning tools to help improve your skill set. Sometimes it could be in using mentors, using coaching, all kinds of form, but you have to be intentional. I don't think it's going to come, like, you don't just, I don't believe, at least so far from my experience, most of the people that have just evolved and grown, they didn't just wake up and just got better and better. They actually did things and invested in themselves. So next slide, yeah. So. Things I thought I should say, I wanted to really talk about attitude. I said, no, it's more than just, yes, it's good to have a good attitude, but I think you have to do two things. You have to feed your mind and you have to protect your mind when it comes to attitude in the workplace. Because some of the skill sets I'm talking about, they will come with tension. They will come with conflict. Collaboration doesn't mean everybody is kumbaya, kumbaya, happy. It means that we are going to have conflict. You don't like the way this guy talks in the meeting. You didn't like the way somebody is um, taking those ideas and flipping them around. There will be tension. So the attitude is so important. And some of the things that would help you is things like really protecting your mind, which means be very intentional with what you feed your mind. So you're not just feeding your mind, but where you're exposing your mind. Because if you come up with the notion, everybody's against you, you start to see everybody in the office as your enemy or your competition. If you come up with the notion there's a good in everyone, you start to see the ability to collaborate, even with the very difficult people. People that most people are like, oh, we don't know how to work with this ones. You'll find ways to work with them. Next slide, please. Don't want to take all that. Networking, so, so important. This is, in my own words, it's really more than networking. I throw in the mentors in there. You have to build a network. You have to build a tribe. You have to build colleagues that would support you, promote your work, you would learn from. So the ones you're learning from are like now your mentors. The ones that will speak for you are now like your sponsors. But it's so, so important. In the workforce today, 
if you really want to get ahead, this is one of your golden keys. Next slide, please. Yes, I thought I put this there because if I reflect on my journey, some of the things that have really made me stand out is this, being present and paying attention. And it speaks to your ability to adapt and be flexible. The only reason you can adapt and be flexible is when you pay attention. You start to notice there's a new trend. There's a new, um, the office is going towards the new, the customers are asking for something new. When you are present and pay attention, then you'll be open to those experiences. You realize that, oh, this is no longer working. Okay, yeah, this skill set is a good skill set that you acquire. And that is when you can see the opportunities. If you don't pay attention, the opportunities will pass you by. Because I know when I started my career journey, I had this nice goal sheet of what I'm going to be in three years, in five years, in 10 years. It didn't play out that way. Because as I was paying attention, I realized that, okay, all of a sudden, people found out that I had this good skill set and they were offering me this. So the question was that, can this take me on the journey? Yes, it can take me to where I'm going to. So yeah, no problem. I will change. I will move from engineering to sales. It still takes me to the executive level I'm going to. So please be uh, learn to be present and pay attention. You also have to learn to go the extra mile. Because when I reflect on people that are so easily promoted today, in most of the companies I have worked with, it's those that go the extra mile. I know it sounds like counterintuitive. Why do I have to work extra? They only pay me this and they only do. It's those that go the extra mile. People that show up and show up 110. There is no way we can take notice. And if the system is fair, we will get them promoted. Because it's so clear that they are in it for the long run. They're going the extra. They're giving way above what we ask. So this is something I think is very important if you're going to be in the workplace. And yes, when it comes to collaboration, I've said a lot about it, but I think the smartest people in the room are those that learn to have the right people working with them. So collaboration, like I said, don't throw that out of the window. You would so need it. A lot of the things you will need to navigate in the office will be tied to social intelligence, working with others. You have to learn to work with, to work with others. People that have different experiences, diverse team, people that are from different cultures, people that even think differently. And that is the beauty of diversity. Your ability to work with them shows leadership. So with that, yeah, I think I made it. Yes, I made it on time. We're going to open it up to questions with that. So should I hand it over? Who's going to take the questions? All right. Clay to you or Victoria? Yeah. Yeah. So thank you so much for that wonderful uh, talk that you gave to us right now, Jane. That is firing. And I'm sure that all the people that we have here, they have great questions for you. I'm very sure about I, I don't. Are you ready for us? Jane. I'm ready. I've been ready. Okay. <laughs> I'm excited to be here. So I'm ready. <laughs> All right. So because you know the way the world is going now, we are even moving to space. So probably you'll be recruiting for space, Jupiter. Oh, you we know, could the have an, we could have an office in Mars. Really, <laughs> definitely, definitely. So that's where we're going to. All right. So to make you uh we are going to make use of the uh raise your hand icon. If you go down to reactions on your Zoom, you will see the raise your hand icon. So what would happen, Jane, is um, you will be looking at your screen in no particular order. Anyone that raises their hands, just pick out their name. So we can see if we can take questions at least for the next 10 to 15 minutes before I invite Sam Johnson back again. I don't know if that's good, if that's uh, OK by you, Jane. Yeah, that works. That works for me. All right. So, guys, uh, if you put up your hand, if you raise your hand, Jane will be watching out. Uh, to see, I can already see people raising up their hands. So, uh, in no particular order, she will be calling names, and then you'll be putting unmute yourself and ask the question. Please, if you're not asking any question, try and uh, mute your mics. Thank you very much, Jane. Over to you. Okay, great. I will go with Faizan. Faizan, I hope I got your name right, Faizan Mohammed, because I saw his name first. Uh, yeah. Um, in in terms of the working world. Exactly how do you see it progressing in the future? As in, what do you think would be different or what do you think would stay the same in terms of future prospects? I think the only thing that will stay the same is that we'll still remain humans. <laughs> 
okay, that's my perspective. We'll still be human beings. So everything got to do with humanity will be there. You know, kindness, empathy will be there. But in terms of the hard skills, it is evolving. Like I put those trends there. We are getting there. We're now working virtually. Can you see? It's now a norm. Uh, I've, we have resumed and we're saying people can choose to work remotely. So those things will change. In terms of the hard skills, they would also change because we are saying with automation, the fourth industrial revolution, the future of work, we will be moving towards you know, more cognitive skills, creative skills. So routine type tax, we're throwing them away. Anything that's routine type, we will find a way to automate it. So in terms of what could change, a lot will change. But the soft skills won't change because that's humans. That's the things we cannot get the machines to do. The, the part of you that we haven't found a way to automate, like creativity, critical thinking to a certain aspect, leadership, those things will remain. And I think that's where you should put a lot of focus. I hope that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. So I'll go for Abdul. Abdul, I think you were next on the screen. Abdul Rahman. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. <clears throat> Here's Abdul Rahman from Bordeaux University. Yeah, Abdul Rahman, you might have to increase your volume. It sounds a bit faint. Okay. Can you hear me? No. Yes, it's better now. Okay. Uh, I am Abdul Rahman from University of Bordeaux. So, my question is about the digital presence. Like you were talking about the digital presence of uh, the LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook, uh, and so on. So uh, it's it's okay when you, when you, we talk about the prof professional digital presence of, on, on the LinkedIn, GitHub, and so on. And uh, but I, what about the Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and so on? Are these considerable for the recruiters to when they are looking for the candidates and so on? So Abdul, I would answer it in this way. I think what we're looking for is like a digital footprint. So you can choose how you want to show up. So you can decide. Some people are just comfortable you know, showing up on professional platforms like LinkedIn. They wouldn't do Instagram and Facebook, TikTok and you know, Snapchat. But what we really want is a digital footprint because each time I'm given an interview list, you know the first thing I do? I just Google the candidates. Wherever the show up is fine by me, I just want to know a bit about them. It could be a YouTube video, it could be an article on the web or website, it could be their LinkedIn profile or their Instagram profile or their Facebook profile. I'm just looking for a digital footprint and that's what we do time and time again. Not just even for recruitment, sometimes even for networking, collaborating. The first thing you do is you look for the person. And we go for the digital footprint. So choose the way you, you know, the one that is more comfortable for you. But I think it's so important to have a digital footprint and be intentional about it. So don't say, oh, I don't need to. Like, it will be very difficult in this time and going forward to just think you can just leave from behind your, your screen and you will not need to have a digital footprint. It's very, very difficult. Hope that answers it, Abdul. Uh, yes, definitely it answers me. So thank okay. you. Okay, okay, excellent. So I think the next is Usman. I don't know why the ladies aren't asking me any questions, but no worries. I'll just continue with the hands up. <laughs> Hello, Jane. And, Hi, uh, Usman. Uh, welcome, Jane and Sam, actually. And it was really beneficial, this session, actually. And uh, now my question, basically, I'll put it in a situational base. So you said you'll start your career in 2001, and you are engineer field, engineering field, basically. So if uh, 2001 team is, uh, has to uh, graduate in 2021 and has to find out job and all these skills are there, she needs basically. And she got, so the thing is that I think obviously there are pros and there are more pressure. You know, we are different. We've got different fields and we should be, people can be confused which fields they can choose with. And there are more uh, competition in the market. If you are in talent of river at the back end, now is in 2021, it's a talent of ocean where you need to find your job and, uh, you know, uh, there's so many people are graduating and you need to, obviously you said we need to be visible, visible, uh, visible basically in the market. So how you think uh, 
2021 change is going to react in all those challenges. Obviously, there are pros, as you mentioned, but it's not easy uh, to uh, get a start in 2000, uh, 2021 uh, in a good market. And also, uh, you also talked about collaboration. So I always think universities as a provider of talent and the companies like Facebook and big companies as someone who needs the talent. And how companies and big universities or maybe uh, big companies, they can collaborate more uh, effectively to recruit basically. Because uh, if uh, if you need, uh, for example, if you need uh, people in the coming weeks or maybe coming months and universities are giving uh, graduates in coming months, how they can com collaborate more effectively to uh, develop those skills, you know, the, especially the soft skills. Obviously degree is there, but soft skill is something which uh, be, uh, skills basically, which are there, which should be uh, obviously, uh, if you need the soft skills and uh, university is providing those degrees. And there should, if there is a collaboration between universities and the big companies, so they can, soft skills can be developed. It's, it's more, I think for me, it's more like socially responsible. The companies can be socially responsible and uh, for their talent and uh, universities can be socially responsible for their talent. So how they can collaborate more effectively so these skills uh, can be developed. This session is an example of this collaboration. To, to as um, basically uh, obviously you are telling us those soft skills are important maybe most of us doesn't know those soft skills are important. maybe we do, do know but the way you said the things where you quoted your experience you quoted uh, how things gonna be what challenges are there what pros are there how recruiters are looking for their talents so uh, what you say is uh, is there can be a effective ways to collaborate okay what's my I'm going to try and recap the questions. So first of all, I'll start with the first one, which is the collaboration part in terms of how universities and, and school and universities and companies can collaborate. There's so many ways. Um, I'll, I'll give you some examples of what I did um, when I was, um, I used to, like I said, when I used to run an operation for Ericsson in Ghana. So one of the things I did, we found out that we had a shortage of skills. So people come with the hard skills, not fully with all the skill sets we wanted. So we went to the school and for starters, we said, you know what, why don't we, when I have an, um, an, an expert in town, a specialist in town, why don't I get my specialist to come and give you a guest lecture? So I asked yeah. the specialist to volunteer their time. I only asked for like two hours, maybe when they come to town for like a week to do an integration for a new technology. They give me two hours where they go to that school and they share insight about that technology. Because we thought if we could prep the talent before, it would be easier. Yeah. We didn't want them showing up and they had no clue what we were talking about. We're talking about mobile money, they didn't know all those things we we're talking about. Yeah. So we said, why don't we just go to those schools and do that? Secondly, some of the things we did was internship. So that's a good way to collaborate. Uh, because when the intents come, we are now you know, trying to groom them to say, these are the skill sets we are looking for. These are the projects we are working on to give you an idea of what we are looking for. So by the time you're coming to be back into the job market, you know what these companies are focused, yeah. where we see the trend, where we see the sector going on, where we see technology evolving. So it's easier to position yourself. So those are ways, but there's so many ways, even it comes to hiring. So those ones are talking about skill set. In terms of hiring, like I know we do, most companies do graduate programs. But like I said, they are also been influenced by the trends. So in the past, we will go to the schools and we still do. But, you know, with COVID, nobody could go to any school. Yeah. Like, you know, during the summer, we go to schools and do like a recruitment drive. Um, now we do them online. So <laughs> that's why you need to have a digital presence yeah, because, because we will share the, the graduate hire program online on LinkedIn. And probably yeah. that's where you're going to find it. Yeah, because the, you have mentioned about the fourth revolution and students should know their, about this fourth revolution basically and they should know what they are expected exactly. from the companies. So if there is a conflict between what we think is companies expecting from us and what companies actually ex expecting from us, so there might be, a, obviously if there is a conflict, there might be a gap in between the expectations to each from each other. So they can, that can be a problem in the, you know, when you start your career, especially. I think, Jane, uh, Usman mm -hmm. is practically saying that so uh, your company like Facebook should have a kind of, which what we're already doing now, have yeah. a collaboration where they like internship, yeah. coming in, internship, 
uh, and all kind of programs so that people will know that, oh, so Facebook is doing or Ericsson is doing or sell, you know, the different kinds of company are doing so that they can also encourage the younger generation to fit mm -hmm. in uh, with the, the small scale, you know, soft skills you're speaking about. First one, you're right. We do do things like that, but I think we need to speak more of it, especially towards the region, uh, yeah. because I know we do graduate hires, we do school drives, but I don't know if we speak more. So we have to use the tools like what we're doing now, yeah. the collaborative tools to speak to it. So if you're doing a graduate hire, why don't we send it to all the schools so they're aware that we're doing graduate hire or we are open for internship for the summer. So yes. I think more needs to be done in terms of creating the And it will be very good if we can have those contacts. Anyway, Sam will connect you again. That's why she's here. So that yeah. we can have that intention. Especially oh, yes, we can do that with really, yeah. Then we can announce it to them. Most of them, I can actually tell you, most of our students are very good, you know, and they are ready, you know, for taking this course. You could know very well that it's very, they are intelligent and we want them to be exposed to yeah. most of those things. Yes. A lot of people are raising their hands. Exactly. We, can take, we can only take two. We can only take two. Okay. If you're only taking two, I think the person I saw was a Jala that I saw next. Yeah, good evening. Um, I'm Adelia Jala. I'm a student of the University of Bolton. Uh, my question is two parts. Um, you mentioned something about evolving. You started your career as an engineer, but I guess um, at some point you delved into sales. I always believe that um, the first job one gets, okay, I'm Nigerian and I actually feel that's the way it has always been in Nigeria. The first job you get can actually determine your career path. I have friends that started networking with me, but they weren't so lucky to get their first job in networking. And today they can do networking again because their first job probably took them out of networking and they had to be dedicated, their, they had to be dedicated to their first job. So they opted out of networking. So was that the reason why you opted out of engineering for sales? Then secondly, um, I noticed you went to an Ivy League college. I actually believe um, priority is given to people that attend Ivy League colleges. Sincerely, I, I have the feeling because they always feel they have the best candidates, they have the best students and everything. So I would just like you to expand sheets on that. Thank you. Okay, I take the questions as they came. So the first one, uh, why did I evolve? Uh, I think I evolved because um, so many things I could speak about, but it's not because I always wanted to be sales. I didn't choose sales. You know, I, that's why I talked about be present and pay attention. I never chose sales. I always saw my career being tech, engineering. I was going to be a CTO or some technical head. But what happened is that I was... Um, you know, I had this free time. I had nothing much to do. I didn't have any project. And somebody had offered me a project to run. And I thought, there's no harm. I'm learning something new. It was a new technology. So it was GPRS in those days when um, when data or internet was just um, commencing. So I thought, oh, something new. We, nobody knows about it here. Let me, let me run it. So I did it for the experience, for learning. Um, but in running that project, People were observing the way I wanted. I didn't even know I was doing that. So what had happened, now this is me telling stories. At the end of the project, it became successful. The client, I ran it for a client. So the client wanted to take it further commercially or make it a permanent solution. And normally then we would celebrate that milestone. So we were celebrating the milestone and everybody was happy. We were all having drinks together. And somebody moved to me. Uh, he was the head of the entire team then and said, come work for me as a salesperson. I'm like, you guys just said, no, I'm not a salesperson. I'm a tech person, I'm an engineer. And he said, no, what you've just done is sales. Because you know what he found out? I knew everybody in the room. I didn't know everybody in the room because I just wanted to go around knowing people. I knew everybody in the room because in trying to deploy that technology, I had to meet different teams and explain the technology or solve the problem or work with them. So I was finding myself in different paths and trying to navigate that and collaborate with them. So for example, training will call me. We don't know how to train people on this new technology. So you have to come and tell us what it is. Then the next thing I get a call from operations, this server, we're having a problem with this server. It's not working with the network diagram. 
I was just trying to figure out the answers. I didn't know all the answers. But in doing that and working with them, I get to know everybody. And that's only what they wanted in a salesperson. Someone that can build connection. Someone that can solve problems and create trust. That's how I landed in sales. So if you had asked me, I would say, no, I'm not a salesperson. And I don't know what it takes to be a salesperson. But that's the reason I landed. So it wasn't intentional. So sometimes you have to pay attention. That's why I said your career is a journey. As you evolve, you're bringing skill sets. You have to always position yourself for new experiences. You're bringing out skill sets and talents you probably didn't even know you had. And if you pay attention, either other people will tell you or you would observe it. That all of a sudden I can do this comfortably and I enjoy doing this. Or, oh, why is it that, you know, it looks like everybody comes to me to solve this problem. You know, what's the need that nobody, why don't they understand? Why is it like it's just me that knows how to solve it? You know, but it's nothing to do with my, 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 my key job. Maybe it's something I was doing for fun as a hobby. So please, that, that's how we, it happened. So to your, what was your second question again? I've told so many stories. Talking, the, second? the second question has to do with you. Yeah, being in, um, I would call it, right? Um, university, right? So Something like what, that. Mm, that question technically could be right and wrong. So when I started my career, it was right. Because I remember wanting to get in on a talent program. And I was told that these were the only schools they were going to take. If I got an MBA from any of these schools, then I'll make it for the talent program. That is so not right. At least now we know better. Uh, because we know that um, we shouldn't be using schools to determine skill sets. And another way I would say it is that I came from the slums. So if you base it on access, I will never be where I am. I grew up in one of the lowest slums in Lagos, a place called Ajegule. So if you base it on access, the school you went to, then I shouldn't be where I am. I have no right to be here. That is so wrong. And we found out it's not inclusive. And that's not a good way to source for talent. So now most companies shy away from that. In short, sometimes they purposely will block out things like gender and the actual name of a school from a CV so that you actually rank the people based on the skill set or experience and not on things that shouldn't be. So it's not right, but I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I think it still happens, but that's not the right way to, to, to pipeline your talent. Okay. We have one more question. My students will remember that word flexibility. And yes. we'll, talk, we'll talk about it on Wednesday. Celeste, okay. yes. I think we can take the two questions because Tim is a lecturer of University of Bolton. And then okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, I was gonna say, okay, so it, go, it goes to Tim and I'm, I'm me. So Tim, I'm maybe it, you go yeah. first, then Ami will go next. Yeah, we should take them. Uh, just uh, keep it coincide, guys. Thank you. Yeah. I do my best. Thank you. Hello, Jane. Um, Hi, Tim. Thank you. That was a really inspirational talk. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask: we have quite a lot of um, we have quite a lot of mature students at, at the university, and from speaking to them, they sometimes can be a bit anxious about the the graduate recruitment market because they're not, you know, they're 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 different in that sense. So, is is there anything? kind of against the, the kind of flood of graduates in their early 20s that someone in their, you know, later 20s, 30s, 40s maybe can do to um, kind of make themselves stand out, really? So I'm, I'm going to say something probably some of them will find uncomfortable, which is what I said. I think they should be visible. They should be visible and be present in the platforms where we source talent. Um, a lot of them probably might also be coming from the notion of the whole day of create my CV, look for someone to give the CVs to. Um, now we do a lot of recruitment by referrals. You know, we do a lot of recruitment by actually going to this platform. Like I told you, in the next couple of weeks, I'm going to spend a couple of hours on LinkedIn just sourcing for talent. So if, if you're not on the platform, I can't find you. Because not everybody, take about proximity, will be able to get to me or get to someone that works for Facebook and get a referral. You know, another way is to go to the platform itself and you know look for the job openings under the career. But the, the so easiest way is that, you know, so why don't you give yourself a better chance? Because if you're a mature student, I think it's so easy to be present on these things. Because you know why? You could share your knowledge. You could position yourself as a thought leader. It's so easy for you because you do have some expertise. 
you have learned something, whatever, no matter how small it is, or, or you have learned the ability to learn. That is also a skill set, knowing how to learn. There's so many things you could you could position yourself with that would give us, you know, that just, I don't want to say, you know, to give, you know, to create attention, but you, you definitely have to position yourself. I don't know any other easier way to say that. It is big because we need that digital footprint. Even when you put those CVs in the platform, we would interview you, but we will also Google you. So just think about it. Is it not better you make it easier for us and just leave the trail, the, bro the breadcrumbs, and we can just fill in the gaps? Thank you very much for that. Thank yeah. you. That's great. And don't worry, Sam, I'm not pitching for a job. You're okay. <laughs> Hello, right. I know you're right. not. Thank you. Okay, I'm ready to your next. Right. So, Jane, um, thank you for the session. Um, and I just, uh, I sort of understand the whole context of, you know, making yourself public and uh, having a public presence. But my question is, what is the simplest way in which you can start, right? A majority of us have probably come out of college and don't have, let us say, any work experience, or maybe we are changing fields or things like that. So how exactly, uh, what are the simplest things that we can share about without actually coming across as imposters or, or you know, facing that imposter syndrome? How do you begin to position yourself and what types of content can you probably start sharing to begin with? I may thank you so much for that because I know we didn't talk much about that because of the time. So one of the basic is just have a profile. So pretend now, instead of, you know, your CV, I said, was static. Now you're creating a dynamic CV. So all I'm asking, whatever your CV was trying to, you know, pass across to us, can you put that there? It could be on LinkedIn or wherever you choose. But create a profile that is just like, a, pretend it's your dynamic CV because you're going to keep evolving. In terms of, you know, how to engage, just basic things you could do. It could even just be asking questions. You read something and you ask the author. Oh, I just read right. your article on five tips of negotiation. I'm just curious about tip number five. Could you share some no. more? You know, what, what, you know, just ask the question. Right. Because right. it shows your ability to analyze. You read it, you analyzed it, and you're asking some very deep and thoughtful questions. Right. We would right. notice it in those platforms. So right. those kind of basic things, I think, are some of you don't always have to create your own content because I know I it takes quite a lot to do that. I understand. Oh, and I actually, I actually think all of them, you know, most of my students, some of them feel they don't have, they don't have skills. I actually feel what they need is to get, put them together. They have a lot of scattered things they have done. So when I teach them the ability to put them together is what most of them actually need. You can't tell me you have been 80 years without having any achievement. You know, the thing is that you don't realize that whatever you have done, just like Jenna said, we help you with the job. Either you take care of your family, whatever you have done, the leadership skill is always there. So don't ever feel that because you have been out of school eight years, you, you don't have any skill. No, you have something. Just look inward. That's why I tell you, when, you when, we're, when we're interviewing you, if you even tell me a story, you know, if you, if, you, if you answer the question using experiences outside work, it's acceptable. Nobody's going to judge you. Oh, why are you talking about your, you know, when you manage your siblings or when you helped your mom manage her business? What right. does it go? We are looking at the skill set, your ability to collaborate, your ability to innovate, your ability to, you know, to be an entrepreneur. So those skill set is what I'm looking at. I, I, wherever the situation you use them, it even makes it more interesting because I would like the diversity of thought. Right, right. Yeah. Thank you, Jen. Thank you, Dr. Celestine. All right. You're welcome. Thank you so much, guys, for all those questions. And There's thank one, you. Teacher, one teacher that has a question to ask, Dr. Shivan. Eh? Shivan. Okay. So okay, I didn't see her. Um, okay. I was about to ask a question, but someone put down my hand, so I'm not... <laughs> I'm sorry about oh, that. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my question is pretty much straightforward. Uh, I mean, thank you for your talk. You, you talk a lot about the, you know, preparing things, um, and, uh, um, presenting your skills uh, about uh, recruitment from LinkedIn. But um, one thing um, I just want to ask, you know, 
uh, in the recruitment. So obviously, uh, we applied through various uh, mediums. So is is the CV enough for for a recruitment, or uh, is cover letter plays a vital role? And if cover letter plays a vital role, and if you consider it for recruitments, then what points you you uh, look at the cover letter? Also, one last thing um, you um, you mentioned you pick people from LinkedIn uh, for recruitment. So, um, uh, would it be possible for you or for your team um, to share some links? You know. Uh, for the students uh, who belongs to networking or security or software engineering. Mm -hmm. So because you mentioned at some point about internship and, uh, and things. So those who don't have LinkedIn profile um, can have opportunity um, to apply for some jobs. Oh, they should create a LinkedIn profile. <laughs> no, I know, but, you, but you just uh, answered I mean, the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know I mean, this. Uh, there are people who don't have LinkedIn, so I mean, uh, would would it be assumed that those without the LinkedIn profile won't get uh, a job or something like that? It, it doesn't. It just means that it's easier when you do. So I'll give an example. When people, when we look for talent, most times we don't ask, "Give me your CV." We just say, "Can I have the person's LinkedIn profile?" And I'm just being truthful. It's so easy to just check the LinkedIn profile and say, okay. But I know people, some people are still, you know, focused or they're more comfortable using CVs. And I wouldn't say that CVs still, you know, get a fair chance. So most times, even the recruiter will ask you, okay, share your CV. Or when you're applying for a role, we will say, upload your CV or upload your LinkedIn profile. So we, we do say that. Um, but I, what I was talking about is how to make yourself a stronger candidate because there's so many things your CVs cannot tell. Um, your CVs most times speak to the static nature of the skill set, but your engagement on the platform speaks to the dynamic, how I can experience it. It tells me how, how good a critical thinker you are or how creative you are. You know, it could even be how you answer the question or some content you put out. So it gives me which is also what I'm trying to do, remember, when I'm interviewing you, is to say, okay, you said you, you have creative skills or, you know, like give me an experience or tell me a situation where you had to use, you know, your creative skills. You know, I'm trying to speak to that. So I'm not saying CVs, but I'm saying it's preferable that you're on those platforms because that's really what will make you stand out. A CVs will be a bit more restrictive now because it's only when you see the job, then the CVs can work for you. With the profile, the jobs can actually find you. Slightly two different things. With, with the CVs, um, I have to have shared the role, you have seen the role, or uh, um, there's an advert out, then we ask you for your CV. What you miss is the nice five fine line of us actually sometimes looking for talent without even putting the the role out there. And what we do is just to go to these platforms. And sometimes when we look for, and I'll be very frank with you, we look for talent even when the jobs are not there because we want to create a pipeline. And that's what we are doing when we go to the platforms. We are building a pipeline. We are saying these are very interesting candidates, having looked at their profiles and you know, having a sense of what they are or their core values or their a bit of, um, their thought process. We think they're good people that are a good fit for our company. We want to save their profiles as future recruitment. So what we do next time we want to recruit, it's just easy to pick those ones. So I'm just giving you some tidbits of how you can make it easier for yourself. It doesn't mean CVs won't work, but if you can make it easier and expand. No, I mean, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. sorry. My my question is uh, that uh, what what is the role of uh, cover letter i mean do you consider oh, cover, cover, letter. cover letter as an important thing if it's an important thing then what aspects you consider in the cover letter so cover letters for me work um, a lot when we're looking for roles with experience so you can use that to create a summary of your either your experience or your profile so without looking at your cv if i read your uh, cover letter it speaks to your expertise and your overall your overall expertise or competence in something. 
And it speaks to things on like why you want to work for the company or why you're passionate about the company, a bit of your expertise and what value you can bring. So that's what cover letter, because unfortunately, CVs don't speak to that, isn't it? You, in, in your CV, you can't say, why do I want to work for Facebook? Cover letter allows you to customize it for the company. A CV is something generic you can pass to anybody. When you attach a cover letter, you're speaking directly to that role and to that company. So that's the, the role of cover letter. So if it's got to do with, a, um, especially with positions that are, are based on experience. So when we do initial recruitment for um, graduate hires or postgraduate hires, so we're looking for people with one or two years experience. Um, one to three years experience because we are more interested in skill sets. I don't think cover letter really matters. When we are looking at someone that's more experienced in a particular skill set, so you're looking for someone that has 10 years plus experience doing this, then a cover letter becomes important. Okay. I hope I answered that question. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I thank think you so. very much. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Jane. Thank you very much for that talk. And uh, I just want to use this avenue based on what uh, the last uh, Shivang said, because you've talked about collaboration. Because I'm a student of University of Bolton, I'm saying that because you're representing Facebook, maybe you can start by collaborating with University of Bolton. <laughs> as you're going to be looking out for people on LinkedIn, our students of University of Bolton can send in their profile or digital portfolio and you can take a look at it because we have very smart students, very smart lecturers who have taught these students. You might want to take a look at that. I'm, I'm, I hope I'm speaking the mind of a lot of people here anyways. <laughs> if, if, um, I, I know that's a tight thing to ask for, but maybe you can look into that. You know. Okay, we can even do it better where I could share because we are always recruiting and the tech companies are always recruiting because there seems to be a boom for expansion. Remember, everything is becoming digital. So the tech is having a field day. I would share the career website link and please feel free, like the jobs are immense. Like any country, any state, different skill sets, different roles, feel free to just look for what fits you there are a lot of um you can sort it based on your location skill set and stuff like that then secondly um we could take it a bit further and see maybe when we speak to, uh, myself and Celestino, i'm not too sure who we can see how we can ensure sam, that sam, when we sam do, is ready she's always okay, there. Sam, yes <laughs> when we do the graduate hire because we don't do the graduate hire it's not like something we do we do it most time in the summer but i think next year we also want to do it earlier in the year we can make sure that you know we would also reach out because there's a team it's not like that's my job so there's a team in hr that or recruitment that does that so we can also reach out for that all I right think that would be a, a more sustainable way because if i had to do the recruitment all the time i think i'll be overwhelmed <laughs> definitely definitely all right thank you so much for that i'm sure that will work and also i know some students here still have some questions in their mind, they probably want you to answer. So I don't know if you speak with Celestine, if there is an email or somewhere we could send those questions to and then we'll have some response back. Reach me on LinkedIn and you'll get your answers. Okay, Just thank you. Me. Thank you so much. She's very visible in LinkedIn, so. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I would like to invite back the head of School of Arts and of also Creative Technology, Sam Johnson to uh, do something really, really important. <laughs> okay, uh, can someone make me a co-host, please? Is that okay? Yes, that's, that's okay. Is that okay? Have we done that? Oh, okay. Lovely. Okay. So if you bear with me one second, here we are, here we are. Can, can you Ooh. see that folks? Yes, can yes. everybody see that? That's yes. fantastic. Yes. Well, please may I award you Jane with the first of our guest speaker awards <laughs> um, that expresses our gratitude for gracing the occasion. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. 
and um, I'll stop sharing that now. We'll send that to you so you can keep it forever in a file somewhere. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I mean, from my perspective, I'd like to just echo, I mean, the word Tim and other people have used, you know, that's a really inspirational talk. And what I'm fascinated by is your reference to self-management. And that's not logistical or practical, but that notion of self-management as knowing who you are where you might want to go, but what your values are. So it's so much more profound than what's written, you know, down in a sort of to-do list, that knowing who you are. And I think that's a, that would be a really interesting journey for many of us as educationalists. How do we assist and facilitate students to know who they are, not just what they know, but who they are? Because as you say, that then builds courage to be flexible, to take risks, to make yourself visible when if you don't know who you are, it's that bit more difficult. So I'd, I'd be fascinated. I can't wait for you to come back and do just a whole evening on self-management, Jane. Um, that would be absolutely fantastic. So thank you. <laughs> yeah, thanks very, very much for joining us. Uh, thank you, Sam. You've set me up now. You're trying to say, OK, Jane has to be back. <laughs> uh, that's right. And I'll tell you what else is fascinating. And I, and I think people have probably hopefully learned a lot is, you know, the power of excellent storytelling. You know, yep. the power of storytelling, you're so right, goes such a long way. And it takes practice. Not everyone's a natural storyteller. But if you can tell a story, your story, in a compelling, entertaining, lively way, you're halfway across the, you're halfway across the finish line. And I think that was a really valuable lesson that you all taught us there, Jay. So thank you very, very, very much for your time and your expertise. That was just a lovely session. Thank you. And I think I'm handing over to Celestine now to, to wind up the evening. Yes. Yeah. I think I'm there now. Thank you very much, um, everyone, for coming. I thank you, Jane, for accepting uh, this invitation. This is just the number one. We have tomorrow, you know, the, the, punk, the man, the, the punk in the series will be speaking tomorrow, you know, and it has a lot in stock. Invite your friends, get on the CV part, as Ivan was asking. We have someone prepare for your CV. The, the, the month is loaded. So be there. Thank you for coming again. And uh, everyone have a good night. Thank you. All right. Well done. Good night. Thank you, Jen. Bye. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.